Hello, I'm Rachel Bleeber with Film Independent. I am so excited today. We have a very special Q&A, but before we get started, I have to thank uh, our very supportive partners. Thank you to our incredible lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, and our screening partner, Vision Media. And with that, I'm honored to introduce our guest moderator for today. Uh, welcome, Carlos Aguilar. He will be um, talking all things Women as Losers. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it's a pleasure being here with all of you guys today. Uh, so the, the audience has already watched the film, so we could uh, get to engage with this uh, with this work uh, freely. No me busques, pendeja, que te vas a encontrar, te lo digo ahora. America, speak English. This whole time, he's all I've thought about. Good morning, Vietnam. Welcome home. Did you miss me? No, 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 no. Today we have director Lisette Feliciano and three, uh, you know, a real treat with uh, three of the wonderful cast members of the film, uh, Lorenza Iso, Chrissy Fade, and Brian Craig. Thank you for joining us, guys. Hi, thanks for having us. Um, so I'll start with you, Lisette, just to get a little bit of background on the film. I understand that that you were sort of in a dark moment when this idea for the film or, you know, this real life story that inspired so came to you uh, through your mom. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that you know, where you were when it came to you and how, how it all happened, the, the, the onset. Yeah, I'll run through that really quickly. Um, I was pretty much ready to give up on the industry and quit because it just wasn't really working out for me. Um, and I started thinking, like internalizing that, like, okay, maybe I'm just not that good. Maybe everything everyone always said is true. Um, and I had to go home and basically tell my mom that, and she'd been one of my greatest supporters. And I, you know, it's, it's a really hard thing to tell one of your supporters that you failed. I think everybody on this call has has their supporter as well. Um, as I was like, I failed and I'm very sorry and I will pay you back, <laughs> I'll figure it out. And to her credit, she didn't, she said, that's not what's happening. This, tell me what's going on. And I explained to her like the barriers that I was coming up against Then they were very arbitrary. Um, and she, instead of putting it on me, she really shared her experience as a woman in the sixties and the seventies. She was trying to make it in the real estate industry at the time. And she started telling me what her barriers were. And they were so similar to what I was telling her. Um, so she showed me that it wasn't, uh, you know, my talent or anything like that. It was very, very much, sorry, there's dogs. It was very much um, the society, sort of a societal issue. And she gave me that power and that history and that knowledge. And that conversation really changed me. And I wanted to have that conversation with a larger group of women <laughs> because I was shocked that I didn't know half the things that happened in this film. Um, so I wanted to make a film that essentially was that conversation with my mom. And so then from there, you, I'm assuming you started, you know, the writing process and I wonder, you know, how did you sort of blend, you know, the story that your mom told you with like perhaps investigation or researching sort of the, the arbitrary and horrible sort of misogyny that was happening at the time and that, you know, to an extent still persists today. Um, it was a lot of research and, and the girls here also like everybody we all I think we all kind of came into having to do our own research of like what this time period was because it's not something that we're educated on. Um, so what I did was I, I put her I just tried to treat the characters um, and put them into this time period. So if you put any character, any person into this socioeconomic background into this time period, they're going to have a certain set of options. And those options are most likely going to go from bad to worse, which then creates the systemic, um, you know, systemic situations that we deal with in the film. So it was a mix of her firsthand account and then corroborating it with what was happening at the time, like the fact that women couldn't own credit cards or own a business or buy a house without a male's consent, essentially. Um, was something that I didn't grow up with. So it was a big eye-opener for, for me and I think for, for uh, Brian and Lorenza and Chrissy as well. Lorenza, how did you did you come into, into this project? I was really, it was wonderful to see you in a lead role that really sort of, it's meaty and with, you know, really gives you a lot to, to work with. I thank you. Um, it was, we met, I, I read the script and the second I put the script down, I was like, there's, there's no part of me that doesn't want to do this. It was completely the opposite. It felt like every cell in my body was screaming to go and sign on to do this. And 
I met with Lisette and, and the meeting ended up being about so much more than the words that were on the script. I mean, it was such an incredibly ambitious script for first time director, but also for a woman and for what she was trying to achieve felt so meta to what the character was trying to achieve. So our discussion ended up becoming so much about our mothers, our grandmothers, our aunts and, and everyone we knew and around us from that time and also from our current time. And it was just such an incredible exchange between uh, two women that by the end she was like, let's, let's do this. And I was like, absolutely, let's, let's jump on this. And she wanted me to come on as an executive producer. And it was my first time doing that. And I, I thank her so incredibly much for trusting me with that because you know, it was an incredible ride of collaboration and, and Brian and Chrissy and everyone just bringing their A game to this incredibly difficult to achieve <laughs> um, thing that we did. And, and there was so much love poured into it because I think we all connected to it at, at different levels because of where we came from, all from very different parts of the world, being different kinds of Latinos in our Latino um, umbrella and I I enjoyed every second of it it was a lot of blood and sweat and tears but it meant a lot um, and it still means a lot now, for all three of you Lorenza Crazy and and Brian I wonder did you did the sort of the story that Lisa uh, told you about you know feeling that she had failed in the industry resonated with you had you all had your moments where you you want to quit and sort of like find you know another a new impulse to to keep going yeah, basically yeah. like every day. <laughs> I want to quit every other day. This morning I was like, what am I doing? Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> uh, uh, definitely. I mean, I I remember having that happen on my 30th birthday. I was like, what am I doing here? I'm, you know, if things don't really pop off at 30, I'm out. And, you know, and then you just find the will to keep going because our, these stories are important to, to tell and to share. And while we probably have to jump a couple more, not a couple, a lot more hurdles, you know, it's worth it at the end because, you know, my dad says a funny story now, like, and, and, it's he thinks it's funny but it's kind of sad because when I was younger I would watch Grease on repeat like all the time I loved that movie you know started my movie musical um journey of my life and eventually they showed me West Side Story and I said Bobby we existed back then you know <laughs> And it was, it was, he says it like it's funny, but it's really actually sad because I hadn't seen myself represented on screen and to see our dances, our music, our culture was really like, and so for me, I think if I keep going and if I keep doing this, I could be that person that someone watches on the screen and says, oh, okay, I could keep going. I could keep pushing. I could keep doing You've it. already done that, boo, just FYI. But yeah, <laughs> in my opinion, <laughs> I already look up to you, but for sure, for sure, for sure. <laughs> There's a lot of love here, by the way. <laughs> uh, Brian, I feel like uh, you just turned 30, right? So I wonder if you could <laughs> talk oh, about that that feeling, no. perhaps, of, like whether you feel that, have you ever felt that, you know, that arbitrary sort of like goal that we set for ourselves are like if I don't make it at this point I I'll quit yeah, uh, I mean yeah you know and in, in this industry you, <laughs> I mean you get a million no's before you get a yes so that's that's kind of the theme of of the journey all the way through and um yeah I mean I've I've had a million of those of those moments of wanting to uh of losing faith in it or or thinking maybe I should try something different um but I don't know with this with this film, you know, specifically, I I had just come off of a network uh, show where, you know, at that time, I really had the chance to either take time off or put another project in that uh, in that slot. And like when this came along, I felt like with the show I had just done, I was kind of already on the on the theme of representing the Latin community, which it really needed to be represented at this time and then also a film that was representing women and um it was it was just the perfect project that I that I wanted to do um I really wanted to do like a real life story like a like a guide to recognizing your saints type of film and this just had all the elements that that I really wanted to be involved with um 
So at this particular time, when this movie came along, I, I, I wasn't feeling so much uh, defeated, but <laughs> I'm very happy it came along. Um, Lisette, you know, I wanted to, to ask you about, you know, as Lorenza mentioned, this umbrella of Latinidad, you know, that as we see on screen, it, it, it takes many different color shapes and, and sort of experiences. And I wonder, you know, when you were casting and, and thinking of who you were bringing on, how did that play a part on, you know, bringing Lorenza and Chrissy and Brian? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, frankly, I really didn't think about it um, that way. I, it was very much about, let me just show people, let me show people with dignity. Um, and obviously this is the cult, this is the, 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 the place that I wanted to set the story in, but it wasn't a conversation that I had really had in my mind. It has become a conversation now, which I think is the testament to their performances that they, we were able to tell this story without it, the identity being the story, quite frankly, um, which I think as a community, we are sort of shouting at that <laughs> we are just mainstream. And I don't think any one film can can umbrella all of Latinidad. That is just impossible. There's too. There's so. I mean, we have Asian Latinos. We have Indigenous Latinos. We have Afro. We have everybody. Um, the Spaniards were did not discriminate in who they um oh, enslaved. Nice. So <laughs> we were. Uh, uh, they were not discriminatory. So it's 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 tough. I think what we're doing in particular, and and Lorenzo said it perfectly. She's from Chile. Christy's from Miami. Brian's from Miami too. I grew up in, in the Mission District. We're all very, we're all American in how we uh, interact, but we grew up in pockets of Latinidad that are so very different. Um, so with this story, it was, we just didn't even really focus on that. We just focused on it being a woman trying to, uh, you know, have some agency over her own life. We focused body. on it in her body. Um, her ability to make choices and her ability to make money, quite frankly. I think our, our, our story is really about our ability to make money, hold it, create it or not, um, and generationally. For Brian, it was about um, engaged fatherhood, engaged partnerships, a young man making a decision to be around, regardless of who, where and where he came from. For Chrissy, it was about a young woman deciding to take up space in a very big way and how misogyny regardless of where you come from, misogyny is built around keeping you in a space. And there are two very different characters here. Um, one actually dies because she will not stick to the rules that are set out to her. Um, and I think that still works for, our, for the world now. So yeah, I'm glad that it's representative. And I think that the reason it's representative is because we did not go in trying to represent anybody. We went in just being human beings with dignity and a hero's lens. Um, Lorenza, this also gives you the chance, you know, to to embrace that in, in, in the language. I feel like, you know, I don't know if I've seen you before acting in Spanish and English in the same film. And I feel like that's, you know, just shows the range of, of, of the character and of your acting. And I wonder if that was special for you in any way. See, <laughs> it's very special. I mean, I, I so much of this movie is pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, you know, that thing that we say at the beginning. And, and like Chrissy said, having the will and continuing, that was such a, a theme throughout and I think I came to America because I grew up in Chile and I I really came with an American dream and I really came with this idea of what America was and 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 what it could give me and I I thought there was no ceiling to the roles we could all play and and I've learned pretty quickly that there's a bunch of ceilings even for me a white passing Latina with all the privilege in the world of you know looking the way I do and and having grown up the way I did and it's just fascinating to me to get a pocket like this where I got to play what I've, I've, I've always dreamed of playing, you know, that complexity of being an immigrant Latino and, and, and dancing around all these different cultures and being able to switch from, from so much of us is that, is that Spanglish nature. It's the fact that a lot of Latinos that grew up here don't want to speak Spanish and didn't even learn the language. Um, that those are really interesting conversations that, that come to mind when, when I was doing this and, and what a pleasure it was for me to be able to navigate that because in searching for this American dream, I didn't realize how much I would lean into um, American speaking, American parts and, and the whole point of being an actor is being able to do so much, right? And, 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 and to, to become these different characters. But this one 
was really, really special because it touched close to home. And I love acting in Spanish. And that's definitely something I had been wanting to do. So to be able to do it both <laughs> that way was was just a real a real treat. And it just grounds you. It's, it's interesting what happens when you switch to Spanish, because I feel like I even sound different. I don't even think I'm the same person. <laughs> and so to be able to do that in, in, in a character in, in a movie like that, it was it was really wonderful what could happen working with the other actors and doing those scenes and 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 navigating that. It was it was special. Amazing. For for both Chrissy and, and Lorenzo, I mean, you guys have some really, you know, tough scenes together. And I feel like Chrissy's character becomes, you know, a, a catalyst for uh for uh, Selena in the film. Uh, so I wonder if you guys could talk about, you know, playing teenagers, which, you know, I, I completely bought the whole time. And you did? <laughs> I did. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it, it works. <laughs> uh, playing sure, teenagers sure, in, sure. In, in, in such difficult circumstances, right? Of, like these two young women navigating something that, you know, probably could have definitely could have used parental help but that that wasn't there. So I wonder uh, how you guys navigated those things with these young women. <laughs> I know. Um well, we were lucky that we had the script was such an amazing blueprint. And then we also had Lisette with us every step of the way. I mean, I think even in that classroom scene when we were filming it, Lisette had her wireless monitor and was like under the desks like with us, just really kind of like supporting us. Um, and uh, yeah, and it was it was a lot easier when you had such an incredible scene partner that you know, we would have all these deep conversations between takes and, you know, after we were filming and we just really connected and I felt very safe with Lorenzo to like explore this and really kind of um, represent the women that we lost in that time period because abortion was illegal. And, um, you know, it's still, it's still happening today in the world in different countries. A lot of them are the, the poorest countries in the world, like Latin America, Africa, Asian countries, where, you know, women are dying because they don't have access to safe abortions. So, you know, it was, it was a heavy kind of uh, conversation to have, but it was a necessary one. And I was just so grateful that I had these two women at my side. Yeah, that definitely helped. I can't imagine having that. I mean, I can, but like having a, a woman be with us during that whole thing was really incredible. It, it, was, it was a very safe space. I mean, and to a lighter note, I think the teenage thing, yeah. <laughs> one of the brilliant things about this film was the, the breaking of the fourth wall and what we did at the very beginning where you see, you know, Ryan like shaving his head, his head, his, his, his beard and the baby <laughs> like showing the audience and kind of bringing them into the struggle that it is to get resources to put on a project like this to get away with the fact that we're teenagers and we're showing like we're, we're jumping through an entire life story of this character and her friendships and what happens after and the loss and the grief and the abuse and the systematic fucked upness that they that she goes through I think the biggest device to to achieve that was the breaking of the fourth wall. And even right before Chrissy screams in that in insane scene, I remember it was like really late and, and I was having to give this speech kind of like flat, like not just just like this is a, this is a fact, like this is what's happening. Like it's a catch 22. And then she starts screaming. All of those devices were super helpful along the way because it just reminded me that as Chrissy said, what a necessary story we were telling. And we didn't want to preach. We were trying to not be too, like, we know better. In fact, it was more, this is a story and this happens a lot and this can, and this still happens. And it's brutal and it's incredibly raw. And I think it would have not been possible. And I know we've said it before, but I'll say it again. It wouldn't have been possible with, with without that support, that female support that we had or our incredible male actors that were just there to to do this thing in a very real honest way and that's I think what was key to make it you know respectful and with dignity right to just yeah. be respectful of each other and and allow ourselves to feel safe and going that because at that time there wasn't any safety and there weren't any resources yeah. and I always say like the the fourth wall thing it really like connected the audience to Lorenza and and to the people and so you feel like I'm, I'm a part of this journey with you. But I also think it was important to have you start the film and be the same actor throughout because then you are witnessing a whole journey 
because if if you would have cast a younger actor to play you as a teenager then I think that would have like not have been as impactful mm. I don't know and then I guess you'd have to cast everyone else older <laughs> so that it didn't look like strange. again resources but also yeah. I prefer that because that's probably the last time I'm doing a teenage role so I'm happy yeah, yeah I think I think so too I was even hesitant to be honest at the beginning of it because it was like oh, she's 17 the whole time uh, <laughs> You know, you know how old I actually. No, but it worked because I was the same person. It was like it's I true. It's genius. <laughs> These are very, very difficult conversations to have, and so the so fact you that get very we, creative with little money. Huh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so kudos to us. I feel like you get to be more. You have to be more creative when you have to be resourceful. So. Yeah. Lisette, can you talk a little bit about the, that fourth wall, sort of uh, at what point in the writing that you decided that this was going to be a, a narrative device that, that would work for this story? Day one, dude. I'm sorry. I feel like we're like kid gloving this. Day one. Like, mm -hmm. as soon as I wrote that story, I was like, I mean, it's so insane, all of this stuff. Like, it, it, these, these scenes don't make sense without that fourth wall break. Like, a scene about Lorenzo trying to go and get a loan is like not stuff for dramatic ire unless that loan officer breaks the fourth wall and tells you, hey, by the way, it was totally legal for me to turn black people away um, and, and single women away. And I could say it to their face and no one could do anything to me about it. The fact that that was 1974 and before is insane. And I didn't know that. So without those fourth wall breaks, like you lose context, you lose character, um, connectiveness, you lose the ability for the, these actors to be in on the joke, the joke that is the, you know, the, the, the life that we have to live and these arbitrary rules that have real consequences to not only our mental health, but our financial health, our generational wealth, you know, like I was only able to make this movie because my mother would not stand for that. And we had a little bit, a little bit, because this is a rich kid's game, let's be honest, a um, little bit to be able to do this. The reason to Christy's point, like well, that horror, that's really sad story about her dad saying her telling her dad, oh, well, I don't know we existed back then. Because <laughs> if you don't have the money to make them, you're not going to do it. <laughs> it's just they're so expensive. They're so expensive to make, quite frankly. And that's why you see this this culture and this time you see America in the 1950s and 60s through a very specific lens, because that mm -hmm. is the lens of the people who can create it. Um, and why, why you feel like there are no people of color in the 60s in, in, unless you're watching West Side Story. It, like, it, we, we weren't the people that were able generationally to, <laughs> to pay for that. I mean, aside from Desi Arnaz, there was very few. And when our stories were told, they were told by white guys. Yeah, well, I mean, and then also, <laughs> I'm just like, don't, don't, adding on to that, but yeah. my, <laughs> we have a lot to say. <laughs> no, but my, my family came from Cuba in the late 60s. So anything they had from the 50s, 60s was in Cuba. Like there, there was no, they had to start from scratch. So I didn't even see pictures of my grandparents young. And that's why I didn't know that we existed back then. Like, you know, I was a little kid. Make no, it didn't make any sense to me that, I mean, obviously, but it, that's, we have to start all over because we're starting in a new country and starting, and then we have all of these things to overcome. It's just, it, yeah, it's pretty, it could be daunting, but we still do it. And like, Lisette still made her movie, even though people are like, you know, period pieces are very expensive or that, you know, <laughs> I mean, amazing. yeah. Like, the amount of times I got told, make your movie in one room, says all you can afford, kid, please get out of the office, is insane. Like, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do a period piece. I wanted to tell a big sweeping story. And to the, the original question about where those fourth wall breaks is like, I was so frustrated at that point that I had just been content. The expectation of me was so little. And the expectation of this community was so little that I was like, okay, you already expect zero. So what am I losing, right? The fact that Lorenza Ito, <laughs> this is her, the leading role that everyone is seeing her as a, as a leading actress, which she always has been now is, is, is not so to me. She's been around for 10 years. Like, where's everybody been? You know, Chrissy Faye is a dramatic actress. Like you can watch any of her movies and see that if you're paying attention, you don't even have to pay attention hard. You know, Brian Craig has this, emo he gets, you know, I'm sorry, you get a lot, a lot of the, the, the bad boy characters, but you have this emotional depth and wealth in you. And because of who they are and their backgrounds they are not even getting considered for that stuff, that never sat right with me. So I felt, I saw a lot of the stuff that was holding me back 
back in the journey of the people that we casted. Back to your point about teenagers or whatever, it, it doesn't matter to me. To me, it's about the soul of the person. And Brian's mom came to us on set and said, this is my story. Brian, you better tell the story good. And he had that investment. Lorenza, same with her mom, Chrissy with her parents, Simu with his parents. Like it was everybody's story. And I think that's why it's been so connective to audience people from all over ages, up, down, center. Everybody's like, damn, I know what it's like. Brian, uh, in playing Mateo, you know, and with the character in Grand Hotel, like I feel like, have you felt like you're sort of embracing perhaps something that you had, you know, playing Latino characters? Yeah, I mean, so I, I grew up, um, my, my mother's from Cuba, and uh, her whole family's from Cuba, and I've never had my dad's side of the family, so I, I grew up amongst, um, you know, all Latins, and uh, Grand Hotel was the first time that I actually got to play a character that was Latin with a Latin family, and then, um, and then this movie came along, and then now I'm actually playing another Latin character on another show, so it's been really cool to be kind of accepted into that world and, and be allowed to, to represent a little bit because um, even though I may not be categorized as that, I mean, that's, that's the family I grew up with. That's all I know. You know, I've, I've never even met one person from my dad's side of the family. You know, my mom's family became my dad's family. Um, so it's really cool to be able to be a part of that. And, uh, I maybe not firsthand uh, understand a lot of the struggles, but like certainly my family has has been through them all. So um, it is really nice to be able to to represent them, you know. You know, st staying with you and, and, and with Lucette, I wanted to talk about, you know, the male characters in the story, which I feel like is very interesting how they're not portrayed as, as you know, they're, they're complicated characters and perhaps, you know, they do bad things, but they're not sort of like simplistically portrayed as villains, you know, Mateo and Simu's role, like have sort of like, you know, moments when they recognize what they've done and, and, and the things that they've sort of like, you know, how they participated in the misogyny. And I wonder how you approach uh, Mateo in that sense. Or you asking me or? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I think the thing that is really authentic um, about Mateo is uh, he has a lot of qualities that uh, a, a lot of Latin men have. Um, I know that I've seen these qualities in, in cousins, uncles, grandfathers, um, all things like that. But um, like Lisette said, you know, the, I think the point of Mateo was to really kind of bring light to uh, like engage fatherhood and, and, and being uh, like a supportive partner because that's also something that's that's very common is, you know, young fathers getting in over their head and kind of stepping away and not becoming a part of um, not the issue, but the situation at hand. And I think, um, again, you know, uh, the, the I think the male characters in this movie were we're really there to support the, the bigger idea and, and the bigger message. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I loved, I, I connected to Mateo, you know, immediately. Um, like I said, it was familiar and um, I think it was a necessary, necessary character to have to, to support everything else going on in the film. Lisette, could you talk a little about writing these male characters and sort of your, your perspective and not making them simplistic or, or sort of like putting and any sort of blame on them. Yeah, again, it goes back to the dignity lens, right? We want to shoot everybody with dignity. Um, that's across the board. What we're always, what I'm always trying to achieve with any character. With the guys in this story in particular, if you again, if you put these men in this time period with these options of how they're supposed to act, this is how they're going to act. So it, it, it's, also, it's really hard to judge anybody because would you do anything different in their shoes? I don't know, right? We don't know. We just know that this is what happened. Um, so the male characters were very important to me not to villainize um, because they are also dealing with their own circumstances and their own traumas. Like a lot of our community went to Vietnam and came back and were not you know, supported in their own way on top of having to deal with masculinity rules changing for the first time really where femininity was evolving and masculinity was kind of bumping up against it. So Lorenza and Brian had to represent that time period, not only for this culture, but for America. Um, 
with regards to to you know Brian coming in and and being this this character in this Latin world, it was honestly an eye opening moment for me because I had to remember that it's not on me to tell anybody who's Latin enough or not. The things that were had always been thrown at me, I was kind of bumped in. It's just you realize how much of this is in you without even knowing it. So that that casting situation for me was a big eye opener just in my own biases. That was hard. Um, but the guys, they really came on to his point about engaged fatherhood. That was the message with Mateo. Like, they have choices too. They can decide to be there or decide not to be there. That's a choice. And that's a choice that our young men are, are not, not our in any community, but like a, a, men in general, that's a choice that people have to make, that men have to make if they're going to support these partners. Are they going to open their eyes to how much the women in their lives are dealing with with so little? And are they going to support that? Or are they going to be a detriment to that? Um, and, you know, it's, it's not an easy role to come into for either Brian, for either Simu, who also had to come in and give the perspective of, you know, the, the Asian American community and everything that they had been going through and the, the cyclicalness of all of it. So, yeah, this movie wouldn't have, it, it needed, it needed those male perspectives. Right. I mean, you know, going back to, to you just mentioned Simo, I feel like a lot of people are going to recognize him now, you know, with his Marvel role. And, and, and this is a completely different side. I wonder how he came in and how did you sort of, you know, what was the research or, or your your take on on unfolding in the experience of the Asian Americans at the time and how, you know, there had a, perhaps a different sort of point of view uh, from from the other characters? Um, I came into that because I grew up in San Francisco and the Asian community is very, very potent. So I grew up around the Asian American community and I always respected them and respected how much their work ethic and, and how much they did with so little and so many things getting thrown at them. Um, a perfect example, Chinatown is a four, five, four blocks radius because of the discrimination that they had. They were put into this tiny little corner. And instead of saying we only have four blocks, they built alleyways behind to expand their streets and now that's a now that's like a cool you know now that's a tourist attraction but that tourist attraction was born from innovation based on discrimination and i recognize the the the, the cyclicalness of the latino american community going through that now um and again not knowing that the chinese exclusion act was the thing where the, the government actually said you cannot marry an asian person and seeing and being quite frankly afraid that these things are happening again with another community. So I have a lot of respect for the Asian American community. I respect them so much um, with everything that they've gone through. I think as Latinos, we respect them greatly and we've all grown up near each other and around each other. Um, same with the African American community. So it, it didn't make sense to tell this story in San Francisco without including other marginalized communities as well. Absolutely. Um can you talk a little bit about, you know, I think so all of you have mentioned the, the sort of resourcefulness that you had to implement to, to make a period piece. And I wonder, uh, you know, did that, when you were writing the screenplay, you had to like be thinking about how am I going to pull this off? How, what can I show? What can I not show? Where can I shoot this? And, and the fact that you decided to, to make it, you know, true to your story in San Francisco, I'm sure that also came with, with its own sort of issues. Um, yeah, well, it was hard. We moved locations every day, uh, sometimes two, three times a day. I think we got maybe six, six hours of camera time uh, a day, which was really hard. We shot that dance sequence in one night, plus four other scenes that night. It's like insane. Um, and it wouldn't have happened without this cast because they were really, I'm telling you, like war buddies in there going, okay, I'm going to learn this dance step today. Lorenzo was running, she'll speak to this, running around from dance to like rehearsal, dance rehearsal to shooting her scene. We were freezing. It was, it was a lot, but they did it in a beautiful way. And the reason that we did it this way was because these issues are now, they were in 1967, they were in 1927. So it didn't really matter what time period we were in because it, it's all the time. So we use that as a creative device of saying, yeah, okay, we can't afford this to do this. You're going to see modern day cars, but also this is still a modern day issue. So it kind of worked. I don't know if it'll work for everything for every film, but for like, it worked for ours. Yeah. Anyone? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead no, no, yeah. And, and that's like in the first couple pages reading the script, when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, this is genius. Like this is so smart because we'll still be able to tell the story and and ask 
forgiveness, but um, I do, I have the pictures of Lorenza in her costume as um, a cleaning lady and also then dancing salsa and you have like a hairnet on and it was like, it, it's just so hilarious because you were running two set, then back to rehearsal, two set, back to rehearsal. And we learned the dance, Carlos, literally the night before we shot it. Thank like, God Chrissy was there because she was <laughs> at rehearsal. It was insane. <laughs> like for those pitch perfect. And we had to adjust. I was like, Selena's not, not a good dancer. So she's just going to follow the girls. She never really learned the dance. She's just going to be focusing on beautiful Brian. And that's what's perfect. And it worked out. <laughs> crushed it you crushed it but you know we're meeting cast members for the first time and then have to like you know wrap our legs around them and be like oh it's so nice to meet you Brian <laughs> um, you know and it was it was it would just gave us a sense of like okay we're all in this together we're doing this and we're we got so close because it was an important story for us. We're, you know, it's an independent film. We're not getting paid a lot of money here, guys. So it had to mean something to us and it did. And we just, I, I mean, I, I'll never forget that. It image. added to it. I feel like it only <laughs> added to all the performances, having to hustle that level, you know? Yeah, yeah. For musical numbers, a lot of the, a lot of the time you have like a whole day, two days, sometimes a week to film. It, it kind awesome. of becomes like an action action sequence. You know, there's so many camera angles and moments that you have to catch, and especially in this number where we're we're dancing, we have so much story to tell. This is the first time that Lorenz's character and Brian's character see each other, and and it was just like a lot to accomplish and. Um, I think I think we did we did a good job because we had everybody's help Lorenza and support. And I, Lorenza and I hadn't even met. I don't think we met our first day on set, and our first scenes were the the massive argument on the set. So we were like, "Hi, how yeah, are you doing? We so met like thirty minutes shooting. before shooting that. <laughs> <laughs> Which, like that, like Christy just said, that's just a testament to like how passionate everybody was to make this project because if they weren't like it, it just wouldn't have panned out like passion and like wanting to do this job and tell the story like made it happen like no one took this just for a job you know or else yeah. we wouldn't have gotten through it <laughs> yeah. 100%. yeah 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 and like even in the rehearsal we were filming on that same location. So we had to have the music so low or do it in between takes. And, and you know, so um, really, really kind of, uh, kind of fell back in love with acting again, because I'm like, oh, okay, you, this is what it takes. It takes everybody coming together to make this happen. Yeah. Um, They're very brave actors. These are very, like Lorenzo, Chrissy just mentioned, she'd come off Pitch Perfect, like they have all the money in the world. Lorenzo had come off a Tarantino movie. Brian had come off a huge network project. And to come off of those resources to come and tell this story, which had zero resources, was like, because they wanted to be there and because they were really just strong, they're strong actors across the board. Like I'm saying, when you go back to casting, cast for people, because they're all great actors. Of course they are, they're here. But casting for people is what's going to get you through something like this. And across the board, I think I'll still always cast that way. They're amazing, amazing talent. And, you know, that passion has continued to this day. When we shot this movie in 2019, we're here 2021. And they're still here talking and supporting and being a part of it with, again, not a ton of resources because, you know, we don't have the type of resources to, you know, really do the, the contender thing or do any of that the way that, you know, some other projects are able to do but we've had so much support from the festival community so much support from film independent so much support from communities that are recognizing oh wait a minute you guys are still kind of doing this you know on a shoestring with with not a lot um behind you and that that has always been such a beautiful blessing to me because even to this day in this section of it we're still bootstrapping it we're still here we're still in the conversation because we believe in it and because people are believing in us and that's really beautiful I mean, I think it's very ambitious that you decided to have this musical number you know perhaps a, a nod to like a West Side Story type of thing so I wonder where did that come from and you know you, you could have gone many different ways and had decided not to have it but I think it really adds to the story West Side Story I told Chrissy and we were gonna do a, 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 a Rita Moreno 
because again, when we were trying to make this film, everyone's like, what's your comp? What's your comp? I was like, well, I have a hundred years of films not talking to me. So my comps are very small. So I pulled comps from everywhere, but obviously the one comp that we all had was West Side Story. And so I was like, okay, we're gonna give love to that comp. And so I was like, Chrissy, do you wanna be, do we do a Rita Moreno thing? And she's like, where is it? Where's the dress? Let's go. Oh my God. Yeah like my dream come true what's happening um but yeah I but I do remember the set coming to the hotel room and saying what if you sing it and I'm like oh we can do that yeah and she goes like you just sing it and I was like well we gotta go to a studio we gotta yeah. do the whole thing and then she was just like but can you just do it here and I was like I mean, I could, you know, and it's like all these like things that you're like, well, that's not proper procedure or whatever. And then we're like, oh, actually we can freaking do it right now on my computer. And like, we tried and we did all this stuff and, and then it made more sense that it was just like a, a dance. And, um, and it was, it was so, so thrilling for me um, to be able to pay homage to the movie that kind of just, made me believe that I could do this as a profession as you know and like the queen Rita Moreno um so it when when she came and said let's do a dance number I was like all right let's let's make this happen um Lorenzo you know your character you play this character through so many stages and jobs and sort of like we really see a huge arc and I wonder you know, at every step of the way, how you, how are you approaching Selena, given that, you know, she works as a cleaning lady and eventually starts making, making her own way in this American dream. I wonder what was going through your mind playing all these stages. Um, we didn't shoot in order. Right. So um, <laughs> there were days where I was jumping from being 17 years old to being a house, to being a cleaning lady, to fighting for land, to being attacked by an abusive stepfather, to having to fall in love again with my love interest. It was, it was all over the place, but there was a running theme of relentless will. And I think that was a nice kind of more like a compass for me to get to remember where I was at. I obviously had Lisette who literally had by like by day four, we figured out kind of like all the nooks and crannies of our system of what I needed versus what she, what she wanted to get from me versus the actual constraints we had. Cause like, I remember the first day Lisette was trying to do these like things to get me to relax. I'm like, we don't have time for this. We have to like go and go and go. And then we figured out pretty quickly that we had even less time than we thought we had. Yeah. So there was, and it was nice because we figured that out pretty quickly and we got into a really good rhythm where it was like, okay, seeing this. And I would, there was, I did it. I was, I was even changing like in the room. Like I would just like, everyone was around. I would take off my clothes, put on other clothes. I'm pregnant now. Oh, I'm crying now. Oh, I'm laughing now. And I think, you know, Lisette and I would huddle. She's like, okay, this just happened. This is where you're at. Go. And it was kind of, that became kind of a rhythm, which I loved because it was, so much more simple sometimes you overthink this so much and it allowed me to just kind of be in the moment to just give what I had at that moment and it, it really forced me to be present in a way that I hadn't done in that way in, in that manner before um so it was it was I I would always just pull on to the fact we're trying to get through we're trying to figure out a way to make this work they're saying no to me I'm gonna do it she's saying no to me I'm gonna do it and then I think my favorite moments, my favorite scenes were like when I could make Selena be happy, you know, like I when I would really ask for another take, like when she first see those numbers and her bank account go up, like to me, that was the movie, that hope of giving a woman agency to be able to get have financial stability. However the fuck she got there, she might have used Simu. I don't care. That's what was available then. We're going to use it. Um, those scenes really gave me so much joy to do. I mean, when, when I do the scene where I figured out I can buy land and I go to the guy and I'm like, well, you can't stop me from buying land. Then I'll never forget those because I was like in the background, like really stressed out because we had to change five times we were in this bank and then Liza and I Liza Whale and I would like would be changing and then the guys would come through and they're like oh my god we're so sorry and I'm like literally it's we have no time to do this we just have to do it like this and so I think I I leaned I leaned on a lot of those um mini success moments for Selena they were like the the most um I don't know, joyful ones because there was a lot of pain. So <laughs> those were really great to have. It was I always forget and I need to always mention it. I think it was like 19 days, right? 
What's that? A 18. Film. 18. 18. It was insane. This is not right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, regardless of what you think of this movie, like, I really don't care. The fact that it was made and that it makes sense and that it's an HBO Max, it's like, yeah, like oh my God. Yeah. Literally, it's like a true right. testament to what real passion and talent and and just grit can achieve. It's nuts, you guys. It's really crazy. Like a very, very tiny, small budget, shooting six hour days while moving everywhere. Like, it's crazy. I'm so proud of it. Like, so proud of it. And now it's on HBO Max next to Dune. <laughs> what the fuck? Who's cool? Like, Wait, is that us? Is that my face next to them? Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. It's like the biggest budget in the world and the smallest budget. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 yeah, there you go. That's that. That's the pulling yourself up by the bootstraps Latino way, you know? You make yeah. it till you make it. Absolutely. Um, Lisette, given that, you know, that the seed for this story was sort of your mom's story, I wonder what she thought of the movie when she saw it and what, ex what that experience was for you. I love it. Oh my god. Well, she loves all of these people. Um, all, she's constantly like checking in, like, how are they doing? Um, when she watched it, I was really nervous. Like, that was the one that I was like, oh my god, if she doesn't like it, like, what did I just do here? But she watched it and she got real stoic. And my mom is kind of a blab like a jabber mouth like me. And so she like didn't say anything. And I was like, oh my god, what's happening? What do you what 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 what? Um, and then she just kind of was like, Good, now they'll know. And I was like, oh crap like wow and she's like good good you know and it what I think what that meant for her was yeah that did happen and it was like this and it was very difficult and I'm not the only one so now whoever is watching this they'll it really see touches it. mom sure. sorry it really touched like my mom was yes. she's very critical of my work I mean up until like I <laughs> She's always like, yeah, you do a lot of this in that movie. Like you raise your eyebrows a lot. Like she's always super mean. Like she's got zero filter. Like my mom, zero. My mom is like, what is this? I fucking hate it. Gordita, estuvo bien en algunos momentos, pero cuando haces eso con los ojos es medio raro. ¿Por qué está haciendo tanta mueca? And after she saw, and I, by the way, I do. And like, that's like my like, like hurt point. because I know I need to do less. Yeah. And after this movie, she calls me and she was like, still crying. And she was like, te, te lo creí todo. She was like, I actually believed you this time. I actually <laughs> believe She's like, now you're an actor, honey. You're a real actor. Like you were meant to lead movies. And I was like, oh my God. Well, thank you. Good to know how you felt for nine years, but great. Thank you so much. That's the biggest uh, like win when the Latina mom gives a stamp of approval. You're like, oh, I have a future here, guys. I um, might have not been screwing around for ninety years. Great. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean by they'll. I think that's what she meant by they'll know. She doesn't mean like the people in her life. She means the people who are watching it, like everybody who has a woman like this in their life, which is everybody. Like so many <laughs> yeah. people have come up to us during our screenings and said, I need to call my mom. Or, I, or damn, I was raised by a single mom and I was really hard on her. You know, that kind of transformation has been really beautiful to see. Yeah, and that's not with just Latinos. That's with, with every Everybody. community, every white every. mom, all, yeah, everything. And I mean, I've mom. gotten a lot of people say, you know, I knew someone who passed away because of an illegal abortion or I also had an abortion, abortion. And like, you know, it's just, it's like that thing that people don't want to talk about. There's so much shame behind it. There's a movie, there's something that they can relate to and share and like cry and, you know, feel comforted by each other. And so that's a beautiful thing that I've experienced too. Amazing. Uh, before we wrap, um, just because I'm sure some people are wondering, Lisette, uh, why did you choose this title of the Janis Joplin song to to give title to to your film? I wonder a lot of people might recognize it and, and think, why is it called that? Um, because the Janice song uh, is, is says the exact same things our movie says. Uh, she questions why we're second class citizens and she questioned it in 1967 the way we're questioning it in 2021. Um, and I thought the way she's, you know, she's a feminist icon and she had a, move, a title, one of her second songs she ever wrote, um, one of the first that she ever performed in San Francisco. And it says women as losers. And it's, it's, sometimes it seems like we try so hard to be positive. We try so hard to be like, this isn't happening. It's okay. And 
what I heard in that song was the ability to acknowledge the barrier, to laugh at it and to find a way around it, which was the theme of this film. It's the theme of all of our lives, I believe in our own way. And that's why I begged her to let me use it. And I don't know how it happened, but we ended up on HBO Max with it still there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think she was up there pulling some strings for us. So Amazing. that's how it happened. I want to thank all of you guys for being here with us today. It was a wonderful conversation. And as they mentioned, if you want to rewatch the film or recommend it, it's on HBO Max. So uh, go ahead and rewatch it or tell people about it. So thank you, Lisette, Lorenza, Brian, Chrissy. It was a wonderful talking to you. Thank you, Film Independent, for hosting this chat. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Film Independent. Thank you, Carlos. Thanks, guys, for showing up. It's amazing. So happy.